Okay, okay. Sir, we are now in the room, sir. Okay, right. Good morning, Madhu sir. Good morning, Madhu sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, good morning, Vivek. <laughs> I never thought I would be joining. <laughs> <laughs> no sir I, i used to join but in between like today is relatively okay. good day okay the post covid strokes are much common sir so that's why we are like, slightly busy in the nights and all oh i know i know i know hmm. and post covid stroke patients have more venous thrombosis is more <laughs> yes sir so interventional work is very good strokes sir. and post vaccination strokes Uh, uh, is, but uh, sir, luckily they are distal embolic like strokes, sir. Like PCO, distal PCO crucial. <laughs> they are not massive strokes, sir. Less common, but this um, uh, non-vaccination strokes are ICAs and MCAs, so requiring work. Good morning, sir. So, Madhu, we can go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so, good morning, everyone. I will just like usual pattern. I will start my session. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay, right. So, good morning once again. So, this is the thirty seventh edition of this scan rounds. So, as usual, I start with one small case and then go for real cases. <laughs> This is a story of a 44-year-old man who has presented with acute onset of diplopia and dizziness for three days. Now I'll show the video of the patient. Okay, come here, sir. Individual, individual, no. Right, I've never been there until now. Let's go down, okay? I'm going to take the picture. Individual, side. Let's go to the right side. ഡിപ്ലോപ്പിയാട്ടോ one and half syndrome sir is it one and half syndrome but the abduction is uh, full bilateral i know bilateral i know right field starting only it is been abducted in this diagnosis in your left foot where me left eye is front and right eye is abducted abducted in the first of the time is have low In fact, it's a mild skewed view. The right eye is a bit low compared to the left. Side. With that, you can miss it. Now, uh, what will you like to do in this patient? Accommodation. I want to know whether it is in the midbrain or whether it is in the pons. Yeah, it can be anywhere in the MS. From pons up to the midbrain. Convergence. Convergence. So this is the gate to the patient. So, I, I, I expect I, I want to. Do you need to ask? Convergence part. I did not show that part. Convergence. That tells you that least. Not in the mid brain. Can be in the midbrain also, but more likely to be lower down because convergence is spread. It can still be in midbrain. Only thing is, the convergence center should have been spread. Now, what investigation you need? Obviously, MRI. An MRI shows a paramedian infarct. Now, classical teaching is that if you get bilateral eye, you know, it's more like an MS rather than eye an infarct. Here is an case of infarct producing bilateral eye. You know. I just caught the case that not because of the rarity, only to show that bilateral eye infarct can also occur with an infarct. It's rare can thing, but it's still can occur. Madhu, you, Madhu, you think he has got skew deviation? Yeah, in fact, if you very carefully, 
the right eye is Shadow lost jokes. compared to the left eye. That means yeah, the, but, he, but he has no ptosis. He has no ptosis. Can, can you unmute those who are uh, not listening? Please unmute, please. Yeah, please mute, please. He has no ptosis. No ptosis, no ptosis. Yes, no. Okay, right. now, uh, but uh, you did not show uh, uh, that uh, uh, in the catch up saccade, you know, for that uh, catch up saccade, because yeah, that is also thought to be one of the things to. Yeah, that is the, the, the MRI to central to know that it's a central cause. Yeah. Or hints, part of hints. No, in, in fact, this is not a vestibular well syndrome, this is only iron no syndrome, no? So what okay. do you because it's an abduction. Okay, so it's not required here. It's not required. It's not required. But there is abducting this type of you can see the abducting this type of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So this only. Now I'll go to the next case. This is a 32-year-old female. It's a little interesting case. Notice blurring of vision of the left eye on prolonged use of a computer. It's a short case, but good case. That is an only complaint. It usually occurs in the evening when she works in the computer for some time that she started having uh -huh. blurring of vision. She closed her right eye and found that it was compared to the left eye. She complained that she feels some blurring of vision followed by left temporal headache after using the using the laptop for a long time. She noticed that the blurring of vision was confined to the left eye. She noticed, detected it after closing her right eye. The problem was worked only on the left eye. There was no diplopia. She was detected to have defective vision of the right eye on a driving test two years back which remained static since then. So that's another story, but she's come with this particular company. So I'll show the video of the patient. Can you look back? If the left view is dilated, not reacting. Right is normal, reacting well to right. Looks straight, kind of matter left. Left eye is not reacting. Okay. From shifting okay. from the right side to the left side, again, you find that there is the continued to remain dilated. That means it's a different view period. Okay. 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 Visual equity was normal bilaterally. And it's really no, 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 six by 18 on the left side, right side. That is, she was blind and she was detected on defective vision two years back. But in the left eye, where she complained of blurring her vision, was normal. Field was normal. One day normal. Intraocular pressure was normal. Pupil left dilated, not reacting directly or consensually on throwing light to the right eye. Extra ocular movements normal. First of the same as examination. This is ophthalmologist finding they detect go to the window of ophthalmologist. Right side is 18, then 16. Then uh, all other things say that they check the pressure and not normal. The history was reviewed whether she has put some drops in the left eye or is definitely a trauma. There is no history of trauma, no history of applying any eye drops to the left eye. No. What is a localization? What is a directly diagnosis? This patient? Is you it know, IDS people? Uh, it could be IDS people. What else could be that? This is one possibility, but it's only duration of only two weeks or two months duration. Now we don't know at this point. Of it could be an efferent pupillary deficit, that's all. Whether we are dealing with an early compression therma, we don't know. And also you have to keep that possibility in mind. Okay, anyway, what are the possibilities you want to keep in mind? Sir, uh, if it is early third nerve compression, how is the, on the right side also it is getting affected? No, right side the vision was detected two years back and remained static. And all findings were normal on the right side. 
probably some refractor or something we don't know we did not detect any neurological problem on the right side except for the detective vision and that history was dated dates back to two years back and remains static so that's a macular disease there we don't i don't know but neurologically we couldn't find anything on the right side the only abnormality found was pupil was dilated fixed react not reacting and the visual equity on that side is not Maybe home side or uh, early third now partial left side. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing you have to keep any possibility. Can be tactile vision. Occlusion you should have. The receptor. Pupil will be slightly irregular. Uh, no, that's a different thing. That's a corrective in between is again a great. But that's not a tactile pupil. Tactile pupil is a dilated pupil. Showing something on the phenomena. Okay, the treatment. So, so this can be unilateral tactile lesion of the brain and brain, home side pupil. Can be millefacial variant starting from the beginning as pupil. I have seen people coming with millefacial in the brain only with pupil there. Yeah. I've seen one patient, I think I saw one sometime back, only bilateral pupil was affected, nothing else. But here only unilateral, no, sir. Here it is unilateral, agreed with you. But still, I don't know whether can unilateral MFS can occur, although you are not very certain. No? But this is a recent onset. So these are the possibilities. And the most common, other common will be drug installation. Probably inadvertently some eye drops have been put into the eye that you put it there. That's a possibility. As repeatedly asked, she denied putting any eye drops in the eye. Okay. What about reaction to accommodation? Ah, exactly. That's what we want to know in this patient. So this is the accommodation reflex path. This is the how the intacted lesion differentiate from different third. I mean, compression of the third nerve palsy. What you look for is light near dissociation or ARP. Intacted lesion accommodation reflex is preserved, whereas the light reflex is absent. And it can be unilateral, classically described as bilateral, no, in ARP due to syphilis or diabetic neuropathy and all, they are bilateral. But here it is sometimes unilateral dilated pupil with lightning dissociation can occur. And this is the site of lesion. So this is the pupillary pathway, as you all know. It comes to the tactile region. From the pretactile nucleus, it goes to through part, or to one silaterally and through contralateral. The other tactile lesion also, the nucleus also gives the apparent to, cross to the opposite side, and both supply the ipsilateral heading in this way. It's a part of the wedding nucleus. So lesion here can produce a pupillary dilatation on one side and showing light near dissociation from the, of that pupil. Because convergence pathway is different. It does not take the light of this pathway. Okay, then you want to know the convergence pathway. Convergence pathway is this one. This is the we still, still we do not know how the convergence pathway is exactly present. There are two pathways. One is the cortical one going to the cortex, visual input go to the cortex, the corticotactyl fibers go into the pretectal nucleus, and then go into the third nucleus body accommodation. It will not come to the pretectal region where the pupillary fibers are going into the tectal nucleus. So, elision here in the tectum, proximal dorsal to the pretectal nucleus, can affect only the pupillary fibers. As you classically see in Perinaud syndrome due to Due to uh, penidoma, dorsal midbrain lesions, etc. So the, the pathways are less certain. In one of the visual cortex, probably descend along the corticotactyl tract, seem to have more ventral course at the mesenchymatic level. Now, next question is now how to differentiate tonic pupil from pharmacological mitriasis? This is another problem which we come across. Two, three points can help. One is the tonicity of the pupil. Tonicity means that once it remains contracted, it is longer time to redilate either due to be, either by removing the light or by accommodation. Accommodate slowly constricts and slowly reacts, uh, re, re, redilates. And the redilate is much more slower than the constriction. And sectoral splinter involvement is another characteristic feature. If you find this is very typical of tonic pupil. The pupil constrict only one part of the pupil will constrict, the other part will not constrict. And classically, the light dissociation. 
but it is a slow sustained contraction of the sphincter during convergence is characteristic of this pupil and is differentiated from a tactile membrane lesion. And where is the lesion for the IDS pupil classically described? It is in the ciliary ganglia. Okay, that at this point helps differentiate between IDS pupil and the tactile lesion. In tactile lesion, the reaction is brisk to, uh, to the accommodation but not to the light. But in here, the tonic, the tonic pupil is a slow constriction and slow reaction. The tonicity will occur only in ADS pupil or lesions in the ciliary ganglia. So if you find a dilated non-reactive pupil with the doctrinal plethia, what to suspect? The setting of comatose patient, the first thing as you all know is the expanding supratendor radiation, the early chronic. In the awake patient, the two problems, two conditions, tonic pupil or pharmacological problem. Now, what does will you do now? To differentiate tactile versus this thing, you look for accommodation. Let us see the accommodation difference. The patient was asked to accommodate. And the pupil remains dilated. Looking at distance. No, 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 she converges the eye, but still the pupil remain dilated. So that rules out what a tactile lesion. So what do you want to do now? I want to differentiate whether it is inadvertently put some eye drops. Some of the chashmas, no, contain this some. Material which dilates the pupil. Some, uh, I don't know, just moments, I don't know. In the the English, English, I don't know what is English name for that thing which you put on the eyelashes and uh, that thing, no? Surmas, surmas. Uh, surmas, surmas can put it dilated because it is considered that dilated pupil is a sign of beauty. So these chashmas, come, uh, surmas uh, contain some uh, uh, thing which can dilate the pupil. So that may be, if it's asymmetrically more on one set, that pupil may be more dilated. So I want to differentiate whether it's a pharmacological blockade or a tonic pupil. What, what should I do? Now I want to confirm whether it's a lesion is in the ciliary ganglia. Now I know it is no lesion in the tactile region, but early compression therna can't be ruled out. So what are things you need now? The pharmacological tests. What test will you do? Cocaine. Okay. Not cocaine. Okay. I'll come to, that. come to that. So before that, I would like to do it to let a compression of the third one, no? early compression. So the MRI was done. This MRI is normal. So that means even though we can totally roll out a miniature pathology, early compression, but this is Possibly compressive lesion is unlikely in this patient, less likely to be in this patient. Now, what would you like to do now? As um, uh, Joyce said, we do the serum ganglion and antibody work, and we want to learn major pressure syndrome that was negative. Now, so it's a pilocarpine test because in cocaine test is for the Horner syndrome. Here, that's to make the pupil dilate. Here the pupil is dilated. We want to make it constrict. So you have to give a pile of some barasambadhana mimetic agent. So it's a pilocarpin. The peculiarity of this um, for IDS pupil is that it, uh, because of the post ganglion, this post this lesion is the ciliary ganglion, as already told before. So it's a post ganglion neurons are which are degenerated. So the sphincter becomes hypersensitive. They develop denervation hypersensitivity. So in mild, even this, I mean, 0.1% of pilocarpin can produce constriction of the pupil, which normal pupil will not constrict, because that will not be effective for normal people, but will constrict if there is an innovation hypersensitivity. And that is the test you do in this patient. So I look for 0.1% of pilocarpin, it is not available anywhere. So what I think I could do, it will take higher strength. And this is after the installation of the pilocarpin. That pupil has become smaller. 
but the reaction is incomplete obviously because the innovation but the pupil has reacted can become constricted with viral therapy so what is the likely diagnosis now homicide syndrome you know that you know let's see what are the causes of homicide is pupil and all the before that to tell you what i did for this patient so i thought this may be some post infective or a benign type of ad is pupil so post viral uh, neuritis type thing uh, ciliary ganglionitis so put the patient on a short course of steroid nurse the patient cup for follow up after three weeks and as i put i drop whenever she want to go to the office you put the or go into the daylight ask her to put the eye drop in the left eye so she is very comfortable with the pyrocarpin drop she only one drop in stage in the morning is enough for the whole day for her to become work comfortably but reviewed again i asked her to come after three weeks after stopping the pyrocarpin don't put the pyrocarpin i want to know whether it recovered or not i'll show the video again after three weeks the pupil remains the same there was no improvement so i told him may take some time for improvement so this is the uh, how to deal uh, if you find a unilateral dilated pupil these are the four causes you have to keep in mind one is tactile lesion lesion the subretinal space by compressing it or a cavernous sinus lesion and ciliary ganglion lesion in tactile lesion the pupil is dilated light reflex is absent but accommodation reflex is present tightening dissociation in subarachnoid space it is an different third nerve is affected so both light and accumulation of the be absent and pupil will be dilated if cavernous lesion pupil can be dilated but sometimes it can be mid position because associated cavernous syndrome is also likely to occur in cavernous lesion so but the other things are equal, same light reflux and accumulation will be absent just like any different third nerve involved now in the case of ciliary ganglion involvement sclerotic pupil it is the acute phase that is dilated and as the disease become progressive progressive it become myotic so that's one point differentiate from an acute ids pup syndrome from a chronic ids pup and the characteristic finding is a slow constriction or prolonged illumination and the redilatation is very slow after the mode of uh, illumination save for accommodation for the accommodation of substance is slow. so just two three slides to tell about something this in initially presence is isolated internal of the trachea fixed dilated pupil with the loss of accommodation in late stages the large pupil reacts poorly to right reacts slowly to near stimulation after re distant refixation the slow tonic redilatation that is transient reversal of anisocoria even though it is see one one, one said pupil is normal the other is uh, adis pupil to go on converging it the, uh, the adis pupil slowly constricts the other pupil also constricts distant remain constricted when you ask the patient look at a distant object distant object or throw it they take away the light what happened mean the normal pupil quickly redilates but the tonic pupil remain constricted for a long time before it gets fully dilated so you can apparent reversal of uh, an isocoria initially the originally you find that the tonic pupil is dilated now after more of the right for a transient period that pupil become constricted compared to the normal cell it's called transient reversal of an isocoria the tonic pupil is smaller because the normal pupil quickly redilates whereas the tonic pupil takes time to redilate and of course right lightning dissociation is there pupil constricts better to near stimuli than the light because this you may ask why the accommodation difference is better in uh, in uh, tonic pupil is because the normal pupil the ratio of the pupillary light right uh, right reflux pathway the pupil, right reflux pupillary pathway fibers are about 30% I mean, those carrying the accommodation is thirty percent more than that carrying the light reflux. Putting it other words, more number of fibers are designed for accommodation. That is the main function of the I mean, uh, ciliary muscle to to make the vision um, avoid blur when you look at a close up of this, rather than the constriction of the pupil due to the light. So more number of fibers are for accommodation. So what happens when they recovers? 
naturally the parasympathetic because the parasympathetic fibers is more than that of mediating the accommodation more than the light reflex sent the near reflex selectively present that is explanation for the lightning dissociation in in uh, ids people i think am, am i clear to you so what about the anchor jack in this cases and they they were normal angle knee jacks were normal in this patient that are presently chronic ids people that is home side is it so the hallmark of ids people is strong tonic response to near stimulation with a slow sustained relaxation due to iris finger aberrant regeneration and hypersensitivity to muscarinic receptor agonist over time the tonic people which is which is usually larger than the uninvolved fellow y tends to become smaller a condition that is known as the little old ad because the people become constricted the little old ad people can be diagnosed with poor light reaction and tonic near response so but in this patient the people did not react to accommodation also no yeah did not react to accommodation also that is the initial phase that initially the people will not react either to light or accommodation when the people start they start regenerating the pupil fiber the fibers come back the accommodation surplus fibers come back earlier than the other thing madhu what are their usual symptoms Do, this is the, symptoms? because because of the sacroplegia paralysis of the ciliary muscles they cannot accommodate at close quarters the uh, the vision becomes blurred because focusing on the near objects become abnormal so they complains of blurring of vision that is this patient not had a problem because she cannot view the this thing for a long period of time and uh, and what the, you said it is post viral no no i i this i am post it this uh, no i will come to that the etiology and and uh, okay okay sir okay sir right yeah. and the other complaint they notice they feel bilateral they if we go into the sunlight they becomes very uncomfortable because people will not constrict So they have to be tend to wear a sunglass to avoid that uh, excessive light entering into the eye and producing the photophobia. The other patient which I had, the her main complaint was that she could not walk in the sun because both pupils were dilated, not reacting. Now this is the IDS pupil. They initially dilate on the right side. This on bright light. On dim light, what happened means the normal pupil dilates. Whereas this is already dilated, so the disparity becomes less obvious in the dim light, as opposed to Horner syndrome, where the disparity is more in the dim light. And this bilocarpine test, this abnormal pupil reacts briskly and much more than the normal pupil, and the dilated bilocarpine will not produce any effect on the normal pupil. This is so diagnosed in these people by uh, a confirmatory test on these people. This dilute positive dilute bilocarpine test indicates that the lesion is postcandidate only. Only postcandidate lesion will produce denervation hypersensitivity. This will not be seen in lesions in the compressive third nerve lesion proximal to the ciliary ganglia. That is why the test is very little specific for a lesion in the ciliary ganglia. Now coming to the causes of tonic pupil idiopathic is yes. most common. then focal infectious inflammation like herpes syphilis botulism these are all from literature only non infectious inflammation like jansel arthritis systemic autoimmune neuropathy like gps milevitchian syndrome cadp and orbital vasculitis jansel arthritis pan polyarthritis nodosa malignant infiltration perineoplastic trauma surgery lesotherapy these are all by causes usually bilateral Now there is an entity called benign ADS people, which I am suspecting in my patient. This is seen in healthy young woman, acute, painless, and large under the pupil and photophobia. It is unilateral in eighty percent, associated with, usually associated with decreased corneal sen sensation, which this patient did not have. Postlot postulated to be due to viral ciliary ganglionitis, and. Uh, This is recently there is one paper on tonic people after COVID infection also I mentioned described. So she was put on a short course of steroid, no benefit. 
the symptoms get completely altered by the doctor. And this is follow up for the patient after the need. People remain dilated. <laughs> Okay, so that's a case here. Any questions? Sir, ah, yes, sir, I have a question. Uh, after shot, putting yeah. the pilocarbine drop, yeah. does the pupil dilate adequately in dark? I mean, do they have problems in dark vision? Yeah. Usually these people will not have problem in the darkness at all because the pupil remains dilate, already dilated. Their problem, their, their problem comes in the bright light when one pupil will fail to constrict. So there'll be more of autophobia and then the, for the patient. This no, my patient, question is, my question is when the patient uses dilute pilocarpin and yeah, yeah, yes, yes. yeah, right. Do, I agree with you. Agree. There's not, there's not a problem. They, they did not come to have a problem with this patient. Okay, okay, thanks. Sir, uh, in that case, uh, in the first two weeks, uh, yes, yes, usually constricted people will not cause much of problem. They can read, they can do anything, but only the direct people, only the excessive light will produce a problem. Because sir, during uh, during night, what happens? The other people is already that which is dilating, so you are not a much a problem because they can see very well with that. Even if light is sufficiently entering the normal eye, yeah. Yes, Umar, you tell me. So uh, that means in the first two weeks, uh, we have to roll out a third nerve lesion because the both are absent in both cases. Really, we definitely have to roll out. So don't doubt about it. Yeah. <clears throat> Madhu, what about their sensitivity in the artificial light, for instance? You know, you said that in dim light, they may not have problem. But what about yeah. the normal, normal uh, artificial light as we have in our bulbs yeah. and all? How are they in that? Yeah, any 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 high illumination light will going to cause problem for these patients. Any bright light of any source will be a problem. That is, she get a problem while reading, uh, when they will probably because of the uh, and the background light from the laptop you know, may be causing a problem. Okay, I have uh, I have seen one patient, uh, maybe one or two patients who had similar symptoms many years ago that they could not uh, they could not bear sunlight and they would almost become blind yeah. uh, i i have not looked from this perspective at that time uh, i i sent them to ophthalmologist and discussed and there are, there's another group of disorders some rod cone hypersensitivity yeah. or rod cone disorders which can also cause similar things. absolutely absolutely that's called hemorrhopia yeah. just like our night blindness in in rp you have got hemorrhopia, they, they are become more blind, more disabled during bright light. Yeah. This indicates a macular dysfunction, macular, usually macular degeneration, yeah. classically described in cone dystrophy. Yeah. Cone dystrophy is yeah. bilateral. So they become, uh, if it's only one unilateral, that won't be much problem. Bilateral will be problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you. Any other questions? So what is the cause of headache in this case? Cause of tonicity. Headache in this case because she has also come. Yeah, it is eye strain only because she says what cannot do the, uh, the, the ciliary muscle is not contracting, adequate to focus. So it's training to focus. No, one eye is focusing, one eye is not focusing. So that case is a, it's a refractory problem causing the headache. After closing the eye for some time, she becomes headache subsides. So Madhu, she became actually all right on her own. Your steroids did not help her. But the, uh, the pilocarpine drops is very comfortable. Yeah, okay. Right on, continue to drop, wear, I mean, put the eye drops as long as you then recheck every month for the pupil is going back to normal. I, I taught her also how to look for the pupil and not in the mirror. Then, then you can start uh, stopping, I mean, start, can stop the pilocarpine. Yeah. But the differential diagnosis is so huge that they need a lot of investigation, including malignancy and all, you know, according yeah. to you. Yeah, but the only thing is, um, you know, called if you find in, in acute phase, it's extremely difficult like this. But it is a chronic phase, it is simple because you find the tonicity. Tonicity will not occur with any other least other than tonic people. Tonicity is because when they regenerate, that indicates regenerate, regenerate, regeneration of the ciliary ganglion. 
when they regenerate the new synapses which forms is less adequate i mean uh, that means it's not a normal synapses so they they take long time to transmit the impulses that is where they react slowly and redirect slowly that's supposed to be given for the tonicity of uh, so how long once we flash a torch you know normally we just flash a torch and that's it Yeah. But in these cases, we have to wait to look they, for tonicity. Yeah, yeah. So if, how many how many seconds or minutes we have to wait to look for? At least one to two minutes. You have to keep the light reflex focusing oh, on that. Okay, okay Madhu. And take it out also. You go on. Keep on. You have to. You be patient. Keep. You keep on looking at the people. Slowly try to dilate. Okay, good point, Madhu. Yeah. Sir, how does she manage the dilute pyloglycan at home? No, in fact, that is a very good question. I do not know how to do that. So I asked her, said, "You take instead of one drop, half a drop, and dilute it with water, and then in distilled water, and then put it dry." <laughs> <laughs> what else? What else can we do? It's not available in the market. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, what about the hippus? Uh, is it something akin to this? Uh, no, no, hippus is little different. Hippus is. Uh, Constriction dilatation of the pupil initially thought to be due to an early sign of optic neuritis. It is not. It can be seen in normal individual. That is where you throw a light. It constricts, dry dilates, again constricts. That's some kind of an oscillation of the pupil which is occurring. That is a normal phenomenon. Sir, I had another uh, thought. Uh, for diagnosis, you need dilute by by local pain to diagnose. Yeah, but for treatment, can you use the regular pyelocarpine? Yeah, yeah, she's using the regular pyelocarpine only. No problem. There is no problem with increased uh, this thing. No problem. So, so only for diagnosis, you need the dilute. Pyloc. Yeah, you diagnose. Other if you if it high strength pyelocarpine, the problem comes is even the preganglionic tissue also will produce constriction. The only thing which will not constrict even with high dose is the pharmacological blockade. The patients, it atrophied pupil, will not constrict even if you put high dose pyloglycan. But third now, least proximal to the ganglion, the conventional third now will constrict the high dose pyloglycan. No, okay. What is the idea of putting this pyloglycan is to cause constriction of the pupil, right? Yeah. Yes. 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 So can we use the uh, other beta blockers which are given in glaucoma? You know, like Timolol drops and all, which also basically produce constriction only. No, that I don't. That's a sympathetic action. No, here okay. what we are utilizing is the parasympathetic action. Okay, okay, okay. Parasympathetic stimulus. Okay. The problem is the postganglionic parasympathetic nerves. So that's why using the pedocarpine. The sympathetic thing use the cocaine and things like that. Okay. Very, okay. It's a, it's an it's an eye opener. Yeah, you also got short, short case, but good case. Yeah, <laughs> not a long case. Okay, then I'll go to a long case. It's a fifty-year-old diabetic uh, patient who is a known case of rheumatic heart disease, multiple mitral stenosis, and mitral reiteration. The complaint started six weeks back when one day morning he developed breathlessness while walking, as well as while lying. He could not sleep because of his breathing difficulty. While lying in the bed, he developed severe pain of both the lower limbs below the knee, and he did not notice any paresthesia in the lower limbs at that time. Next day morning, the pain subsided in the limbs, but noticed in walking difficulty, with the due to weakness in the left leg. The weakness progressed over the next three four days, and then remained static. After admission to the present hospital, he noticed mild improvement in his walk. So this is the story. On examination, upper limb saw normal. So I'll skip that thing. The lower limb, note was normal. इन्हीं उनके पुरी कंट्रा आटा के समय के लिए उन्होंने बुक 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 मारी बिट्टा बिट्टा रिफ्लेक्शन बस नॉर्मल बिट्टा इधर बुक के पुरी से मारी बिट्टा इधर मारा था चवटी 
right foot was no my left side those person was weak in the shots appeared mildly weak but not very definite that is normal on the right side that is really weak blood reflection was normal on the right side normal on the left side inversion is normal on the right side not so normal on the left side which did not pop really this is like i am not cloud full away he may have mild weakness but inversion was weak ും it is normal and right see idu pidiche that i could overcome idu mollot edute but main weakness on the ehl and vertus and those guys idu pidiche reflexes normal and could slightly bridge for the left side if we want maybe no any injection normal and could It's also middle of the table and it's a minor or spot so. There's no sensory loss anywhere. Like he said, decrease, mild decrease on the depth of the rose. They all said correctly. Out. Vibration is embedded over the big toe. That's it correctly. That is embedded in the toe. SLR was negative. That's the story. Eight. Homeworks negative. Put a foot drop like eight on the left side. Tilsua, Tilsua. Maybe it's like foot drop on the right side, Robert said. Foot drop on the right side. He said it's different. He can stand on the heel. Stand on toes. He can stand on the heel on the other side, not on the left side. is uh, but try to check the technique but but he cannot stand on the left side because it suddenly he cannot maintain his stance on the other side the fracture is limited he cannot stand for a minute then suddenly he it's gone so motor system findings confirm both the lower limbs tone normal power weakness of dorsiflexion inversion the inversion of the pantoffles position inversion of the left side weakness of the left ehl and epicondylitis is longus weakness of in core inversion on the right side we are very not very sure hip abduction normal bilaterally tendelberg patient tends to lose balance on standing on left foot dtr all normal sensory impaired touch pain of the left dorsum impaired vibration of the left big toe slr negative So what about hip extension, sir? Normal, normal. Hip abduction extension. Sir, is it an embolic event into the frontal cortex? Yeah, that that's uh, one possibility. Is a frontal cortex? You mean to say cortical monoparesis of the left lower limb? Well, cortical could drop. Okay, possibility. But he has got a um, plantar was fracture anyway. Yeah, first cause of the foot drop. Ischemia with the artery. adding because so uh, the by the by bilateral because the pain won't be the cortical yeah so the pain in the spinal cord both the lower limbs but the neurological deficit is confined to the left lower sir actually there is an obstruction but uh, distal embolization in the posterior tibialis producing the weakness pain. of the dorsiflexus as well as 
Okay. No, but say, uh, but uh, there is inversion, aversion, some weakness. Yeah. So that. Yeah, that can explain. That no? can occur because. Said if I. Posterior tibial artery can explain both plus. Yeah, it can be or it can be proximal can affect both tibial and. Uh, both. Uh, so these are the possibilities. So, what do you want to do now? MRC. Tianjiu. Tianjiu. So. Dop this, Doppler. Doppler first. The no. brain MRI. Brain MRI. So I did not do brain MRI because I thought the least was distant. No, Planned or yeah. Moreover, pain is there, no sir. Ah, that's a story. You know, the story in the place is pain is there. Most likely. Yeah, if it's a cortical infarct, we should put a severe pain in the lower limb. But severe pain in the lower limb. That means some something has happened in the peripheral problem. Or so both, both can happen, sir. Sometimes embolism no, is because. A defibrillation and you mean embolism but, down and up. That's little you can think that possibility, uh, but you can explain that see the pain, the liver limb, and that side weakness. You have to explain that's correlating with the pain. No? What about the peripheral pulses, Madhu? Peripheral pulses are normal. I mean, uh, that will come to that. Peripheral pulses was decreased bilaterally, bilaterally decreased. Dorsal spitis. But popliteal was normal, there was no brewy or the femoral But color of the extremities. Color normal, normal, normal. They are all normal. Temperature, temperature also normal. It is not extremely cold as you we suspected. So sometimes partial, like it may not be the complete uh, uh, occlusion of that particular artery. Okay. So the nerves, nerves are the most affected. So the ischemic neuropathy of that limb can be there. Exactly, that's what I also thought. So Let us sir, see. sir, but the ischemic neuropathy because the angle check is normal. So that uh, the tibial part, if it was in this, uh, the, uh, I mean, the tibial nerve is affected, that should have gone, like the left angle jack as well as the... Okay, you've got a point where the tank, that, that's why I bought this, it's the point I'm reading these cases. So if it is ischemic neuropathy, which I also thought, they just take it to send. But it all depends upon the angle jack law, depends upon where exactly the nerve is got affected. If the lesion is affected, the distal part of the tibial nerve, it can spare the some suppose it spares your gastronomias and soleus. And it will be normal. Suppose it's a proximal involvement of the sciatic nerve, definitely it should be affected. So it depends upon where exactly this hemic involvement of the nerve has occurred. Okay, that is why the difficulty here. Here I left the plantar flexion was normal power. All plantar flexors are normal. The main brunt of involvement was in the conperoneal. Little effect on the tibial nerve because the pressure point mildly weakness of the flexor hallucis longus. Okay, so what investigation you want? Now conduct a study? Yes, sir. Okay. This is now conduct. Right peroneal is also affected between it. 0.1, but look at the more, more affected one on the left side. It's got only 0.7 on the left side. Possibly not simulated. Right peroneal, left peroneal T is TA is also very low. On the right side, tibial is normal. Left tibial is affected partially. See the angle is 3.4 on the left side. The left side tibial is affected, conperoneal is more affected. And the femoral is normal. Sensory, he had absent sensation bilaterally. I'm sorry, on the left is superficial, so and right, so and left, so and all are absent. Probably he's a diabetic, that is why he's not able to have decreased sensation here. Left ADB, FAB is absent. So, you know, it's got affection of the tibial and conperoneal, mainly conperoneal now on the left side. No. What do you want? What else you want? You want a MRI? Anju. MRI or the LS spine was done? Angiograms. Okay. So did the CT and this was a new arterial Doppler. We showed that is uh, post hypnotics monophasic for not the conbanonial superior femoral and angiotibial arteries. No demonstrable flow noted in the post hypnotibial dorsal spinous arteries. 
So in fact, he had left sciatic nerve palsy, but the neuritis, maybe partial affection on the right side as well, but the nerve ischemia second prior to iliac embolic operation. See, what happened means he must have had severe pain. You know, we'll go back to the history. He had severe pain in the night. He could not sleep on both the lower limbs. That improved. Probably the embolism, I mean, the blocker occurred proximally. That embolism might have disintegrated and put to the district periphery. The brunt might have been onto the posterior tibial artery as Windu was telling, as affecting those two nerves. And that is why the, the peripheral limbs have become warm now. There is no, except for the diminished testing, otherwise there is no ischemic evidence in the lower limb. Because it is recovered, the ischemic part is ischemia to the muscles, etc. are improved, but the nerve ischemia has, has, has remained, producing the deficit. And that also has improved a little bit. Uh, yeah. MRI of the sciatic nerve. That I did not do the MRI here. Sometimes it can be yeah. Yeah. It will, it will heal. Uh -huh. That can be done. I am I, not aware that any, any infarct can be picked up in that uh, MRI. Uh, I had uh, I had one case like. Oh, I see. MRI sciatic nerve. Mm -hmm. I should. Uh, uh, in this case, is because since the reflex are bridged in the lower limbs, is it possible to have a, a spinal cord ischemia and due to the uh, you know the aortoiliac obstruction? No, that, that part we looked into. That was not there. MRI of the spinal cord was not so normal. No, in fact, uh, that was and uh, 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 the primary in, uh, thing was the ischemia of the nerve itself. Even the reflex is angle check is present. The angle check you know, will be lost only if there's either if there only either is a demyelinating lesion or a severe axonopathy. If some axons are preserved, the reflex will be retained. Just like you get a GBS with brisk reflex, you know, an axonopathy, but it is reflexes. But if the demyelination is the culprit, the reflex will be reduced. Uh, yeah. Where is the both lower limbs, asymmetry of reflexes, right and left. Why asymmetry? I did not get the point. Umar, what did uh, you say? Uh, I was thinking the reflex are slightly brisker on right. left side. Correct, correct. More on the left side. Right. right. More on the left side, correct. Sir, so are you 100% sure that it's only ischemia? It can, should we rule out other causes? Because if the gate other side is also is like a mild yeah. uh, foot drop. Yeah. Some mild drop, mild foot drop is on the other side. That also can be due to the involvement of the other side as well. Because the history was you with severe pain in the both the lower limbs initially. It does not mean that it's confined on the left side. Right side might have been involved. Could it be asymmetrical uh, radiculopathy, sir? Non demyelinating or axonal, other than the vascular cause? No, it's not a, well, first of all, it's not a DML radiculopathy because sensibility does not show any demyelination. And the pattern, if you take, it is confined to the distal part of the left lower limb in the conperoneal nerve and partial affected the tibial nerve. All other nerves are preserved. It will be mild effect again, distal to the right side. And onset is acute and then improving. Madhu, did you have uh, the, any uh, weakness of the thigh muscles like glutei no. or? Nothing. All, all of this were normal. So then why normal. can't it be? Why can't? Because the only nerves were distal nerves affected, like common peroneal. Yeah. And, yeah. So yeah. why can't the site of lesion be at the level of the knee rather than uh, thinking yeah, of sciatic nerve? It could be. The only point that I said is the angle check was well preserved in this patient, despite the weakness of the mild pressure for its strong. That's a possibility which you can't rule out that possibility. It may be at the level of the knee. But the mechanism you would think that is location, but the mechanism uh, you would think of vascular only. Vascular only because the uh, sudden onset of pain followed by the deficit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so where where yeah. exactly is the operation? The NFS, so as Paul was telling, most likely in the popliteal artery and at or near about the elbow. I'm mean, sorry, the, the popliteal fossa. Implicating you know, producing ischemia to the conperoneal nerve as well as the tibial nerve. The tibial nerve affection was less compared to that of the conperoneal nerve. 
sorry, a symmetry of the de uh, near plus can be due to pain also. It can be due to, that's the thing I was keeping in mind. It can be due to the pain, asymmetrical pain can produce muscle plus on that side. Correct. So there was breathlessness also to begin with. So there can be multiple embolisms, like maybe some, yeah. because in stroke patients also, with the atrial fibrillation and archery, we used to see embolism to brain, embolism yeah. to periphery, renal artery, and uh, lungs also. Correct, so, correct. Perfect, perfect. That's also, that's why you should have breath, breathlessness at the beginning. So that's there. Yeah, perfectly right. What was this patient's vascular, underlying vascular disease? He had, he had a rheumatic heart disease. No? That's the only thing which is there. No other underlying vascular disease. You say fibrillation, MS, MR patient. Okay. Okay. I think that is very, very good. Very good case, sir. Thank you. Okay. Shall I go to the next case? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The story of another uh, short case. 18 year old boy, one week back, he noticed redness of left eye. Followed a few hours later by similar congestion of the right eye. Along with this, he noticed gritty sensation and pain in the left eye, which was continuously present, waking the patient from sleep. So, in fact, bilateral redness more on left side, followed by gritty sensation, just like getting conjunctivitis and all. And, but it was waking the patient from sleep, disabling. In addition, he developed two episodes of diffuse headache and vomiting, which lasted for one hour and is associated with, oh, sorry, associated with the vomiting. So he repeated the stage there and then. So. The first of the headache was occurred two days back and the second occurred one day later. So this congestion, gritty sensation followed by two episodes of headache and vomiting. Headache was diffuse, not unilateral. So this is the picture of the patient. You can see the congestion, I show the video of the patient. Nothing much on examination. There is both eyes are condition. no, but see the severe condition. So the problem is, is it neurological problem or ophthalmological problem? Okay, first of all, is it neurological or ophthalmological? Because bilateral congestion, no? Bilateral congestion, no, no periorbital edema. No condition. No condition. Yeah, that's a clue. So in fact, seeing the eyes, the first thing I said, you already come to your worry, it looks like an ophthalmic problem, but he comes in a headache. So, headache is there, that means it's unlikely to be. But you remember that even acute congestive glaucoma can present with headache. Eye problem can also produce a severe headache. I've seen even vomiting also. So, that totally we can't rule out ophthalmic problem. But luckily for me, he was referred by an ophthalmologist to me. So that makes made me easier. So, so any brewery, sir? Any brewery? No brewery, no brewery. And the vessels, you look, it's not like a classical. Last time I showed you one CCF. Now look at, I will show the video. The, I, this is not the core screw vessels you see. In uh, articulation of the veins, you see the core screw vessels. It is, it is, it is whole throughout this. Not a, a typical high pressure, this is just likely to be. Any hypercoagulable states in this patient? Uh, that we have to investigate, no. So before that, let's say the clinical uh, diagnosis. Now, this is the ophthalmological uh, examination, normal. 6 by 6, pressure normal. They thought initially. Uh, Gonioscopy was done, they said ocular hypertension out. They put the patient eye drops. Subsequently, everything became normal. They got confusion sent to me. So, what in which you want? I have the governor sinus. Governor sinus thrombosis. Okay, MRI with governor sinus. Okay, so bed chemistry was normal. The imaging was done. This is the imaging. 
But Madhu, other than headache, he had no neurological signs. No, no neurological signs. Except his only problem is congestion. The only thing is, it's for headache. The eye pain is disturbing him. He is waking the patient from sleep. I would he say it went. could st- it could still be ophthalmological, although I know it will be neurological. But... Yeah, 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 it could be. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's what is it is. I agree with you because practically I have seen ophthalmic problem patients personally with headache and vomiting. It's all well described. congestion, sir. Uh, no, sir. The eyeballs are radiomatous, sir. No, no. Some there is some prominence of superior ophthalmic vein. Okay, we'll come to that later. One, right. I'll show the entire picture, then you can come. They'll be better, no? Otherwise. Also, the still sequence, then contrast. Okay, so what do you think on the MRI after seeing the MRI? My lateral superior not vein not. is sinus tumbus. Superior so, ophthalmic vein prominence, that itself. Otherwise, normal only. Okay. So, it's unilateral or bilateral? More on the right side. Bilateral. bilateral. More so, on the right. But counter sinus region is normal. Normal, normal. So, what do you think? CRVO. CRVO, how does it can produce uh, superior ophthalmic vein dilatation? The fund is normal. No, CRVO is a CRVO. Retinal vein, no. It's not the superior ophthalmic pain. This most likely cavernous sinus. Uh, that only can cause a retrograde, you know, uh, wavenous uh, congestion mm-hmm. bilaterally. Cavernous sinus thrombosis bilaterally produces only congestion die without any kind of involvement. Unlikely. Very unlikely. Very unlikely. That the globe is not known. Yeah, let's see. Now I'll come back to the MRI once again, which was the relevant findings again. I'll show that thing. Yeah. See, the, this is got a thickening of the orbital tissue yes. surrounding the globe. Somebody pointed out the globe is, and the globe is not enlarged, but the tissue yes. surrounding it shows a hyperintensity. The epistolary tissue is uh, increasing. That is present bilaterally. You can see on the left side as well as on the right side. And More on the left yeah, this is the dilated superior ophthalmic vein bilaterally. You can see that more on the left side. Again, it can be very easily made out here in this uh, superior ophthalmic vein. And you could that you see this this tissue here on the surround. Uh, this is superior ophthalmic. Forget about that. The surrounding uh, the the peristeral tissue that is also thickened and hyperintended. Did you see that thing on the left side? Bilaterally hyperintense more on the left side. Suppose it is symmetrical, I, I, I cannot make it out, but it's asymmetrical, we have to give some significance, even though we do not know what the lesion is. This again, Sipsik is also showing hyperdensity. Then you can... history of boxing or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, it's not hemorrhage, it's enhancing with contrast. This is a very enhancement of the scleral rim is present. This is a report of the ophthalm, I mean, a radiologist. 
mild thickening in enhancement of the uveostereal layer at the postlateral aspect of the eye glue with the minimal stranding of the intracornal fat on the left side, minimal enhancement of the adjacent periorbital optic sheath, rule out inflammatory bar idiopathic orbit inflammation and IgG4 disease. So this, uh, that is why it is occurring bilaterally. Usually we expect, what the, the, the way to approach is yes, could a bilateral hydrophobic way. So look for where it is occluded. One can be covenous sinus as so you are all telling, but nothing in the covenous sinus. Then you have to find the relation of the orbit itself, which is bilaterally affecting. And that's likely in this patient. And it's asymmetrically more on the left side. So we find the enhancing uh, tissue surrounding the stranger. So you have to think of an inflammatory orbital lesion. Maybe idiopathic inflammation or secondary to some connective kind of disease or some other inflammation, whatever it is. Some lesion in the orbit you have to think affecting the sclera and producing blockade of the ophthalmic. The nature we can only deteriorate after investigations. So, what all investigations now you need? Wet chemistry was normal, so it, I, I don't think there is infective pathology. Is like so, in autoimmune pathology, like not any profile was done normal. Cienga, Penga was normal. CSO was also done. AC level? Uh, AC was normal. And uh, AC was also normal. Metrological investigations. Uh, pardon? Hematological? Welcome to entirely normal. ESR, CRP? No, they're all normal. They did not show because in that, that panel usually we send routinely, but they're all normal. The specific investigation, the one which is done after seeing the MRI, they were all normal. So put the patient on steroid, three weeks, everything subsided, totally clear, no headache, nothing. Two days after they are starting steroid, headache, everything subsided. Three, I followed him after stopping the steroid, everything subsided, has not recurred again. They recur again later on, we know. Since something similar to our Prolasa hand or inflammatory pseudo tumor, or some kind of a variant of IgG4 disease, whatever it is, some benign inflammatory pseudotumor condition affecting the orbit itself. The so called orbital pseudotumor. So classical orbital pseudotumor is unilateral, but here it is bilateral. There also produce involvement the tilted periophthalmic vein that can produce clearal enhancement, peri thickening of the orbital muscles. Periorbital muscular sheath can enhance and periorbital fat can be enhancing in the involving. It's not classical of orbital subroutine, but most of the time it is unilateral. But here it is bilateral. That's the point by which I have put the, brought the patient to So, any questions in this case? Was there the pain? Pardon? Was there <clears throat> local eye pain also? And there was eye pain also. Yeah, so you know, I mean, uh, by that token, it still remains an ophthalmological disease only rather than a neurological disease because uh, I mean, nerve is not affected here, no, Madhu. Yeah, nerve yeah. is not opting. Yeah. But I just wanted to make a I mean, it's just these are all eye openers, Madhu, your cases. I mean, they are fantastic because it increases our, broadens our horizon of thinking. Uh, many times we may just um, not even think about it and send it back to ophthalmology. But from neuro, neuro perspective, one important thing is these periscleral, whenever we have got periscleral or these globe and other things, uh, we have to think of MOG also, uh, not in this patient because MOG will always have an optic nerve involvement, which is not here. But MOG is one disease in which in addition to optic nerve, you have a lot of uh, uh, orbital uh, inflammation. Inflammation, perfect, yeah. correct, correct, perfect. Excellently correct. That's called orbital okay. perineuritis. Yeah, yeah, perineuritis. But Perine. not here because here, here nerve is completely spared. Completely no, correct. Exactly. There is one important point to differentiate MOG from uh, the other thing. Uh, Sir, in MOG you can get perineuritis, but uh, what about the sclera? The sclera. sclera? Here it is scleritis mainly. Uh, is, no, 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 no. What happens is that there is an inflammation. No, once there is an inflammation, that distinction blurs. You, you see a lot of uh, surrounding because I have seen some patients where there is a lot of uh, it, it is essentially perineuritis, but then it can go across to the surrounding tissues. Yeah. Uh, it's a perineuritis, means the tissue surrounding the optic nerve sheath also get inflamed. Yeah. 
Sir, considering the history of headaches, sir, uh, does he need any NGO to rule out any vasculitis? No, I don't think so. As, uh, I perfectly agree with what Subhash Kaur said. See, if you, if you, as you go on in your practice, no, you will come to know that anything can produce headache. I have seen symbol, my, you know, what do you call a local eye problem of any kind can produce headache. So that I mean, that's not a very, I mean, important point to say in your state further. So we have got a, a cause here. We found out a reason, and the headache, everything subsided with this thing. I don't think we need to put an answer. No, and the other thing is the other thing I would like to say mm. is that if we are thinking of a vasculitis, mm. which obviously uh, you have thought of. Uh, and you have done a screening like ANA profile, yeah, exactly. ANCA, PANCA, etc. As far as the ocular vasculitis is concerned, ophthalmologists are very good when they look at the fundus and all. One of the best things for ophthalmologists is the, to look at the retinal vessels. They are very good markers. That is how ocular vasculitis is diagnosed. You know, yeah. even in even sometimes in patients like multiple sclerosis, demyelination or other things, the, the ocular vasculitis is seen by a, retino, a retinal examination. And that ophthalmologists have totally ruled out. Yeah. Uh, so I I'm not sure that doing any NGO will add anything to this. Uh, to this. If the patient had a neurologic deficit per se, there is some real justification to angiogram. Yeah. But the patient not any neurologic deficit except, except for the pain. So no neural structures per se is involved. So that's why I did not do that. I did not think of angiogram to be in fact. Sir, there is some in a correlation with the COVID. COVID can just. Miss syndrome can present the retinas and pain of the eyes. I, I don't know. This this patient was COVID negative. Yeah. <laughs> but this patient, uh, Madhu, this patient's MRI was done. They must have done MRA along with that. No, or no? That is usually done along with that. MRA, MRA was not done. MRI was not done. Because we never, MRI is only if it's a separate stroke protocol. Okay. If they don't do MRI. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, sir, uh, or iridaitis or uveitis. Yeah, that can be associated with that with orbital uh, orbital pseudotumor, but it was not there in this patient. If it had been the ophthalmologist, we would not have uh, already uh, tackled. I mean, wanted that problem before. What is that. the what is the follow up, Madhu, of this patient? The patient totally improved. It's no. right. <clears throat> no, but how long is the follow up? Only uh, it in fact came after two months. Three weeks I gave the steroid, a tapering steroid. Mm -hmm. After three weeks, everything subsided to come for follow up after two months, yeah. putting him on some neuro, neural vitamin to, because I want him to come for follow up. If no. you don't prescribe any medicine, he came for follow up, nothing happened. No, my question is my question is what one of the participants has asked. Yeah. You see, ocular, ocular scleritis or yeah. uh, uveitis, this is a uh, disease in itself. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it is a long-standing disease. I mean, it, it will, he will keep on having attacks. This is a disease in itself. Ocular yeah. scleritis, uveitis. You know, this is part of the connective tissue spectrum. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, these, uh, so he needs to a long follow-up by you as well as by uh, ophthalmologist. But the, 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 the way I thought it was a little different because if it were, because I had an ANA profile, all other things, ESR, everything was normal. So I thought more of an idiopathic nature, like idiopathic pseudotumor like condition like orbital pseudotumor, it says one time if and then disappears. There are many causes for the orbital pseudotumor like syndrome, orbital inflammation, as you said, connective disease, etc. If any marker was there, then the patient needs a long term follow up. So this patient needs follow up, but I asked him to come out two months, he was all right, and I'll send him back. If any problem arises, come back again to me. And Madhu, this I mean this is a, we are taking a little more time here. Because it's very interesting. Oh, no problem. But, no problem. but, but uh, uh, as per the ophthalmological examination, hmm. was there uveitis or uh, no, forget no. about radiology? Forget about radiology. But as yeah. per ophthalmologist, no, no, they, no. Did, they did not see any scleral inflammation no. or any. Huh? Thing. They did not find anything. Okay. Only thing was seen in the MRI. The scleral things all came from the MRI. Okay. Okay. Three times they reviewed the patient. Yeah. Three times. No, th 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 this case is worth reporting because. The typical, the typical orbital uh, pseudo tumor we are used to see intra orbital, you know, at yeah. the back, back of the orbit, there's a tumor like yeah. thing and all which responds to steroids. Yeah. But this is a little different from that. This is yeah. this is a different uh, thing, but the pathology may be like that, but appearance wise, it is a variation from the yeah. typical yeah. orbital. Yeah. yeah. So there is some thickening of the epistolic tissue, maybe that may be the inflammatory tissue. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, contrast. I showed the contrast. You showed the enhancement. This is the contrast showing the enhancement of the scleral ring. This is the enhancement seen bilaterally. There's one more cut which I showed initially that also showed the clear cut enhancement. That is only in the orbit. Apart from that, posteriorly, there is no pachymangitis. No, 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 no pachymangitis. Nothing, only in the orbit. If it's limited to the orbit. Yeah, confined to the orbit. So, IG4 levels were done, Madhu? No, no, that is not done. I, I think it can be one of that spectrum, definitely. It, it could be. It could be. One of the, one, see, most of the idiopathic orbit, the solar team, they call it say, IG4. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. The only problem is why I'm hesitant because one thing it's costly, and secondly, if you the serum IgG, it has no value. So what, they, what they say is that you had a tissue that's be sent for IgG4 disease. So that's why you hesitant to send IgG. If you got a tissue there, they definitely would have sent for uh, IgG4 disease. Uh, no, no, the, the whole tissue, the tissue in itself, the test in the biopsy from that orbital tissue. That's right. Yeah, because this classically, I had two, three cases, I had under spectrum in in fact, you may get present multiple tail nerve and it that one to be positive, and that when serum was negative. So that's why the pickup rate only 40 percent will be positive in serum in IG4 disease, in, in, in other than in systemic IG4 disease. That will be useful. The CNS IG4 disease serum doing it's not going to be helpful. Yeah. But, but, this, this case came earlier when the DDMR story at all become very popular. I did not do it. Post COVID <laughs> popularity. First COVID. <laughs> <first. laughs> yeah. Pardon? So, one is the dose of oral penicillin, sir, you started? Only 40 milligram. Okay, sir. And then there is, uh, sir, you suppose if this patient come in an older age group, hmm. will you consider tuberculosis, syphilis, and all? Um, syphilis, I have mentioned like that. I do not know tuberculosis a person like that. I have not seen. Uh, I am not. I, I, I think I can ask because I seen people like all and all. Have you seen like that? I have not seen. I have seen one patient of syphilis in my whole life, so I am not the right person to be asked. <laughs> Some other That's senior person can say. You know, I have seen cypriotic myelopathy, I have seen cypriotic many this thing, many um, cases, many cases, labels, those cells, all I have seen. But this kind of a thing, cypriotic papilloma, optic attribute to cypriotic optic, I have seen. We're making papillitis, I have seen. But this type of presentation, I have not seen. Secondary stage, yeah, secondary stage. They say in the ophthalmology, they say scleritis, secondary stage uh, of cypriotic. Yeah, maybe if that pair could keep them possibility in mind. Sir, uh, as uh, Dr. Kaunsar was saying, still it could be only ophthalmologic disease or no, sir? Still it could be? Uh, it's an ophthalmological problem completely. Yeah. No, it, 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 it's not, does not matter. It's ophthalmically not. Like, the thing is that he has got a problem and he has referred to you with ophthalmology, you have to sort it out. That's all. But then they think that it's not a problem problem because they have not thought about it. It's possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dr. Dasari, uh, that is a very correct comment. You see, as neurologists, many times we have to diagnose the patients for other specialties. You know, we have to diagnose. So that is fine. Uh, but no. but it is it is our neurologist does not diagnose only. He may treat only neurological disease. Now you see, as an example, uh, most of the osteoarthritis we only diagnose and treat compared to orthopedicians. The classic and the, but, but the final thing is, is patient should get relief. Yeah, that's the. <laughs> so, shall we stop or continue for one more case? Yeah, sir, please continue. Sir, one more doubt. Sir, in this case, we should take the MRI brain and MRI orbital, eh, sir? Yeah, 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 of course. Both are taken. Okay. Uh, sir, one question, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, any infectious causes was the ruled out before doing steroid? Yeah, it has to be. It has to be this yes. routine blood parameters, CR, CSR, CRP, CSF, they're all normal. Okay. okay, sir. Okay, then uh, I think I'll skip this case. Uh, no, this is a, a, a little long case, they'll present that case. 
Fifty year old male, complaint started five months back as numbness and paresis of the left foot, which extended up to the left ankle. About one month later, he noticed the same paresis of the right foot. He stood loosening of the chapels from both feet for the last four months. Then he noticed difficulty in getting up from squatting position for the last three months. Parasthesia of the middle two fingers, the left hand for the last three weeks. It's a long case. Started five months back as numbness and parasthesia of the left foot, rejection up to the left angle. One month later, same parasthesia of the right foot. History of loosening of the chapels on both feet. Difficulty in getting up from squatting position for three months. And parasthesia of the middle two fingers, the left hand for the last three weeks. So this is the video of the patient. Napoleon Power was normal. Come on, go for it. Other Thought to mark it. The long finger flexes normal power. It is normal the left side, but left side finger abductus is ADM was weak, FDA was weak. Maraki gave a little Maraki. Introshe will be. You were linking a note. Note. That was normal. But support and normal. Previous is also normal. Okay. We got bilateral moments and possibly bilateral. There may be mild inroads between the right side, but definitely more on the left side. Sometimes they are symmetrically involved, very difficult to find out. Extra T is not affected. The lower limb, tone was normal. Okay, wasting of both parts. Flexion was weak. Bilaterally. He extends was weak by that. Flexion was normal. Flexion was also normal. That is good. Tell <laughs> 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 The tail was weak, bilaterally more on the left side. This is all on the lower side. I suggest it is suitable all other parts of the Absolutely. Traditional ST loss for pain and temperature in post food bottom.
ചെറിയ വ്യത്യാസം വിട്ടേക്ക് ചെറിയ വ്യത്യാസം വേണ്ട നല്ല വ്യത്യാസം ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞാൽ മതി ഇതും ഇതും ഇല്ല ഇവിടെ വ്യത്യാസമുണ്ട് ഓക്കെ ഇത് മാറി അറിയാം പറയാം ഇതറിയാം ഇത് ഇവിടെയാണ് കുറവ് ഈ ഭാഗത്ത് കുറവ് ഇവിടെ നന്നായിട്ട് അറിയാം കിരിഗിരാൻ തോന്നണുണ്ടോ ഉണ്ട് ഇപ്പോഴേ ഉണ്ടല്ലോ ഉണ്ടെങ്കിൽ കോട്ടയത്ത് ഉറക്കെ പറയാം ഈ വരളി പറയണം ലൂസ് ആക്കി ഇപ്പൊ എങ്ങനെയാ ഇപ്പോഴോ ഇപ്പോഴോ ഇപ്പോഴേ മുട്ടിട്ട് <laughs> So, summarizing, motor system wasting of small muscles of left hand, mild wasting of both thigh, right more than the left, on normal in both upper and lower limb, power upper limb, weakness of both introsia, lumbricals, adductor policies, more on the left side. Sina muscles normal bilateral. The lower limb weakness of both hip flexors, knee extensors. Hip abduction, adduction, extension normal. Weakness of dose flexors, flexor hallucis longness, flexor polypus longness bilaterally. DTR all absent. Done with plus present in all contents. Sensory impaired pain touch needle to fingers the left hand. JPS vibrator sense normal in the upper limb. but it is the in fact it is the left hip finger and embedded in both the uh, thrombox positive gait norm so where is the localization what is likely diagnosis first is the peripheral nerve sir and mononeuritis multiplex pattern okay of uh, asymmetric involvement in the low limbs with the hip flexor probably affected and the extensor abductor cervix uh, bilateral drop and uh, asymmetrical sensory involvement in the upper limbs okay if it is mononeuritis multiplex weakness you need the cortices is like it's a markedly weak but the hip adductors are normal so that means it's likely to be a more femoral nerve involvement rather than the obturator that's a point correct now hip flexion is also weak <coughs> cadp sir cadp because uh, here the proximal distal of both lower limbs and the distal upper limbs affected and there is a wasting of the thigh with the hip flexion and knee extension weakness so uh, or we have to think of a plexus and a nerve so uh, better that uh, we should consider root involvement that to mainly affecting the lower limbs in some okay. case cid okay cid be problem one if you look at the left upper limb if the nerve and the weakness and uh, sensory loss exactly confirm the ulnar nerve distribution the right side also the expectation of the ulnar nerve except the sensory is not affected pattern takes takes in fall like a nerve pattern on the upper limb that is correct now let's come to the lower limb lower limb it 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 looks what more like a plexus pathology rather than a peripheral pathology because in the it looks distal symmetrical peripheral pathology part agree due to diabetes everything but if you get the proximal weakness what is the pattern you take as the weakness the flexion and knee extension with no sensor no sensor in the distribution of the femoral nerve distribution 
It's a sensory only distal part. That pattern is not like a peripheral pattern. But upper limb is not like a peripheral pattern. You got the point. So it's unlikely for a radical. Second thing is then in the CADP, you know, did not expect a wasting. But you got wasting on the both thigh and wasting on the small muscles of the hand. It also the clawed point for the CAD. Any other possibility? Was there any edema of limbs? Edema no, no, of limbs? No, he had an ulcer there on the right. Uh, I mean, varicose ulcer, that's all. You know, otherwise, no edema. Anjiri Hansen? He had got a sensory involvement, no? Diabetic. Yeah. Hello, you mean to say diabetic neuropathy plus and in concept? Yes, sir. Now that I think we should not consider because the upper limbs also involved with sensory involvement. Exactly. Whenever the involvement is the distribution of a nerve or a root, think of that lesion rather than think of anterior concept. When the involvement cannot be explained in the distribution or in the plate of the anterior concept, that means a patchy involvement. So better not to think of anterior in this case. Sir, in the lower limb, there is hip flexion and knee extension only. Which is right. sparing of hip adduction, which is again L4. L3, L4, that is not affected. So radical, we cannot... Uh, you know, no. That's that's right. Right. At that point, I'll clarify that. I'm not thinking of right. If you, in the case of a compressive radiculopathy, take this point, or you can use that possibility is against or you come to see like an arachnoidist and they say, but think of a disease like CADP. It does not fit in with the distribution of a root, even though it is called a radical neuropathy. I had a very, very strong objection to call this radical neuropathy because that is not the correct term to be used. That means in CADP, it is the peripheral nerves are affected. Why in CADP, the pattern, what is the pattern? Is it the pattern of the root? Never. The proximal muscles are affected, then distal muscles are affected. Proximal muscles are more affected than the distal muscles. If you think of a proximal hip and extensive weakness due to radical, we expect distal muscles also to be affected equal to more, more to the degree, but it is not affected. So in CADP, the pattern is not in the distribution of a conventional radiculopathy as occurs in this prolapse or occurs in compressive radiculopathy. So in fact, the term radical neuropathy is a misnomer. People use this term only because they found that the proximal nerves were affected more than the distal. That is why to, to, to avoid the terminology of peripheral neuropathy, they came to explain the proximal muscle weakness, they say uh, radical neuropathy. But actually what is happening is that the proximal nerves are affected more than the distal nerves in the case of uh, CAD, uh, CADP or ADP. So they are thickly myelinated. And demyelinating diseases, which are the nerves are thickly myelinated, they are affected. So that is why the proximal muscles get affected more than the distal muscles. So the radical neuropathy in ADP is different from the radiculopathy as you get in dysplasia. So the lower limb weakness can be due to diabetic amyotrophy. Yeah, that's a clear technique. So that's what is this little odd in this patient. So this pattern, when you get proximal muscle weakness, not in the distribution of a root or root with sparing of the sensation, consider the possibility of diabetic amyotrophy. Okay. So he had, in fact, diabetic amyotrophy. That's what I thought of diabetic amyotrophy. Plus, he has got a diabetic mononeuropathy effect and that ulna uh, That's the commonest nerve affected in diabetes in that Apart from next uh, next to carpet. Sir, uh, how to differentiate a plexus lesion when mm -hmm. bilateral uh, uh, no, diabetic amyotrophy from uh, CADP? Because uh, sometimes CADP, the proximal is more and more affected. Yeah. 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 Your point is well taken. That's what we look for the demyelinating pattern, that's on a pattern. In diametric amyotrophy, it's axonopathy. Whereas in the case of uh, CADP and AADP, it is demyelinating neuropathy. So you won't get any wasting of the muscles in uh, in uh, CADP. But here, thighs have wasted in the distribution. Apart from that, you always want to differentiate. Sensory may not be affected, as I said, in CAD, may only confined. 
ഡയബറ്റീസിൽ <laughs> yeah they they but the roots are affected but that means we should not i mean the, the, the confuse between the pathological involvement and the um, and the uh, clinical clinical clinically pathology may be fine in the root wherever you can and in dorsal horn also there is inflammation but that does not make it say it's a ganglion or not so it can be there anywhere where it is so that uh, uh, just because the root and the csf is elevated the pattern need not that be in the form of a hereditary that's what is clinical normal yeah clinically the see the, you took the pattern that metrophy for example diabetic metrophy it is not the root pattern at all you can elevate csf protein diabetic metrophy So let us see the investigation. See, these are the possibilities you have to keep in mind. Multiple, multiple CADP. So a CA and the uh, muscle can be based, right? Yeah, CA, but it's a very, very rare entity. Still, there is a confusion whether there is a there is an entity called CA or not. This is nothing but the multiple motor neuropathy. So and multiple actually, there is confusion between these two. And what is that? I didn't hear it, sir. CA and is uh, chronic inflammatory axonal neuropathy. Okay, that is one. That is, it is called focal motor neuropathy without conduction block and with conduction block. Then multifocal axonal uh, multifocal uh, axonal neuropathy called MM M M A M A multifocal acquired axonal uh, uh, motor neuropathy. So this is all. In fact, there is no point in a uh, name in uh, uh, splitting the hair. The indicates of hair. sometimes it may be compared only to motor axons there it can mimic a motor neuron disease so and so maybe spine that can be with con demyelinating type or axonal type the axonal type is extremely uncommon it is usually the demyelinating type which is so okay so let us see the investigation the left peroneal is inelicitable left tibial is inelicitable right tibial is left peroneal ta was picking up okay then come to the left ulnar amplitude is low right ulnar is okay except for ml distribution the amplitude is quite okay uh, the velocity is all normal conduction velocity is all normal then right ulnar is again normal At sensory, both ulnar median are not obtained. The papers. So, so what are the limitations? So here, here the distal latent is also prolonged. Yeah, this latent is prolonged. Now, in diabetic neuropathy, you can have both axonal involvement and demyelin involvement. To call a person as what a C D a demyelinating neuropathy. you should have it this definite criteria that means that is for prolonged conduction velocity for an distal latency with relatively good am normal amplitude always a decreased amplitude itself can cause long as a distal latency when the amplitude decreases more than 50% you can have prolonged a distal latency 25% and margin you have to give the relatively good amplitude and the distal latency prolongation that typically the confusing pattern the pattern can be both can be seen in diabetic uh, neuropathy so madhu uh, madhu one uh, yeah. uh, just a, just a clarification from you yeah. at this point mm. so uh, which means that compared to axonal uh, in the demyelination the amplitudes will be relatively preserved so, <laughs> and uh, no, I, i did not get can you tell repeat the question before? no if you take if you take a uh, axonal versus demyelination yeah uh, of the same degree let us say of the same degree 
of yeah. the same duration. One is exonal, one is demyelination. Yeah. So will the amplitude be affected uh, less in demyelination? Yeah, it will be affected less in demyelination. Obviously, it will be affected less. What because, is the reason for that? What is the reason? For that? I will explain that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In, in the case of in in, demy in demyelination, amplitude should be normal. Amplitude should be normal wherever it is. Even in the chronic demyelination. Uh, in in chronic demyelination also, the amplitude. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that point. Yeah, just yes, sir, yes, sir. Amplitude be normal. Except that if you get a secondary axonal degeneration, secondary to chronic demyelinating disease, that is secondary axonopathy in, in demyelinating disease, but not in acute or subacute condition. But you can have decreased amplitude in demyelination when there is a conduction block. Yeah. Okay. When there is a conduction block, you can decrease amplitude, or when there is a dispersal of the potential due to patchy demyelination, again you can decrease amplitude. But in those situations, the area of the potential will be normal. Hmm. To real decrease, that means real decrease in amplitude or area can occur only in conduction block. And if you find in a demyelination, unless it is a distal demyelination, distal to our stimulating electrode, the amplitude will be normal. So if the demyelination is occurring anywhere proximal to a distal stimulating point, the amplitude will be normal. Because that distal part is conducting normally. Then you can find what possible stimulation may be decreased because of the associated conduction block or decreased because of the dispersed potential. So, so now, yeah. So, so the, uh, now, in a scenario, which is a very common scenario, yeah. uh, we find all the potentials are absent. Hmm. All the motor potentials are absent. Correct. Does it rule out demyelination? No, it will not rule out demyelination. That only shows, shows that. It may be a block occurring in the, in the, in the uh, conduction block occurring distally in that patient. That's a rare situation that is producing that thing. If you get a block distally, all amplitude will be low. Yeah. Or even absent. That but is that what, is rare. But that is rare. That is rare. That is one condition in, in nodopathy, in a uh, CADP and uh, AADP variant of nodopathies, yeah. you can have decreased amplitude. But actually, pathology, they recover very fast. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Madhu. Just for clarification. Yeah. Thank Sorry, you. Even, even yeah. proximally, if the conduction is conduction block is severe. Even 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 in the involvement is proximal. Proximal is not even normal. If the conduction block is severe. Severe, yeah. Okay. Even if it yeah. is uh, even the amplitude will be normal. See if the proximal conduction block is totally conduction block. Distal part of the second is normal. That will conduct normally in the imagination. So you get a normal potential in the imagination. Unless the block should be distal to a distal stimulating electrode. For example, if it is in the median nerve, it should be distal to a distal crease. Then only you get a, a, a decrease amplitude due to demyelinating block. Otherwise, if you are aware that demyelination block is proximal, the distal amplitude will be normal. Okay. okay. Now the, the other point about coronary suffering to regarding the differentiating axonopathy. In axonopathy also can have a prolonged distal latency and prolonged conduction velocity. That is because if the axons, the, if the, the axons are put there, large diameter axons and small diameter axons, if preferentially more number of large diameter axons are affected, only axons are affected what remains will be slower conducting axons. So they will conduct slowly compared to the conventional nerve. That is why you should give a margin. If the amb distal amplitude is decreased due to axonopathy, like more than 50% or so, that itself can cause prolongation of distal latency and prolongation of conduction velocity. Uh, 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 conduction velocity. And that's a margin, that's a criteria for that. That is amplitude decreased more than 50% of the CMF amplitude. At least the display should be prolonged for more than 125%. The conduction velocity is to be decreased by 25%. Then only we take it as significant. For putting in other words, to call it demyelination in the upper limbs, it should be the, the velocity should be at least less than 32 meters. If it is more than 35, it still can be due to axonopathy. 
within the low volume, the velocity should be leaving more, more than uh, less than 28, then only really can finally call it definitely uh, D minus. The amplitude is low. If 30 millimeters per second, all can occur with axon of because yeah. the pressure loss of large diameter axons. That is why the CDP criteria has come to identify. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yeah. sir. Thank you. Carry on, please. Yeah. yeah. We finished only now. So, diabetic amateur with ulnar neuropathy due to this my diagnosis in this patient. So, what I did was I put the patient IVMP and the weakness of person has become almost totally improved. You can buckling everything subset, but distal muscle weakness, the ulnar neuropathy was persisting. That's what the follow up of this patient. Oh. Now, sometime back, there was a question regarding the two types of, I think Umar was asking this question, I think, whether it's what the two types of uh, diabetic amyotrophy, can diabetic amyotrophy can be progressive or not, can be bidirectal or not, can be with pain and all. So this is chart, uh, this is from the literature only. There is DAM1 and DAM2, that is diabetic amyotrophy 1 and 2. In DAM1 is seen in type 1 more than type 2, whereas Type 2 is seen in type 2 diabetes more than 1. The distribution is bilateral and insidious in diabetic amyotrophy type 1, whereas unilateral acute in diabetic neuropathy type 2. Pain is no pain in diabetic amyotrophy type 1. Pain is present in the, in the classical. The garden variety is the DAM type 2. Sensitive symptoms are not present in, in, in the first one and may be present in the second. All those things are not uh, very important. It lost spontaneous improvement. There are no countries. So, just to clarify the point, diabetic amate can be bilateral, can be without pain, can be in serious in progress. But after some time, they improve also. Both of them they will improve. And in this row, I will skim. And uh, they can, in one third of the patient, the weakness occurs to the proximal arm muscles. Other presentation start with distal symptoms or weakness of proximal muscles. I think I'll sort of skip these things. Is a protein is of elevated diabetic amyotrophy, usually between 60 milligram to over up to 100 milligram, but occasionally as high as 400 milligram. The actual pathology is thought to be intramuscular and nerve in diabetic amyotrophy. Okay. So that's the end of the story. Any doubts? Story still continues, sir. It's better. Serious, see to it, sir. Sir, we can yeah. restart the rest of the program. It's our interview and we were in the way. Okay, coach, are you soft? Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good day, sir. Good day. Good day. Good day.